And hopefully, well, the good news is it seems that this is a lot more secure connection than I had yesterday trying to do this with my advanced anatomy classes and lab. <clears throat> Real problems. Uh, the limiting factor, as you probably can tell already, is going to be my voice. And I have to leave my phone on because as bad as I am, my wife is doing worse. <laughs> and so if she needs something, I'm good. You're going to have, we're going to have to go to pause mode. But that's okay. We'll get it all done and take care of. And I appreciate your indulgence. And I'm I'm not I'm not surprised that this is going on because you're hearing about it from some of my colleagues as well. And nevertheless, a couple of items of business. Number one, at the bottom of week six, where I put the last YouTube, if you got a chance to look at it, I added this. It may be on there somewhere else, but I didn't notice it. So I concocted this uh, document, which is a, a nice little summary from uh, a pre you know, the predecessor to this particular text, an earlier edition. And so it's got a fair amount of notes in a relatively brief format. And we'll, you know, it, it's probably worth your while to take a look see at, I would think. So that's number one on the hit parade. So it's down there. Number two, it's pertinent to lab. I sent you a take home quiz. I hope that I will be able to. I suspect I will be able to make it to campus on Thursday. I really, I think I'll feel better enough because I am starting to improve. But if my wife does not, then it, then I'm going to have to make some, you know, adjustments because someone's got to be here because uh, she barely can get out of bed. So you know, all that, I mean, nothing unusual about that. But hey, that's the way it goes. We'll we'll work through this. Hopefully, we're just going to have one of these for the term and it's come early at least as opposed to being in the middle of exams or things like that okay so here we go so much for the housekeeping this is where we end it so pardon me when i cough and clear my throat and all that and i sound very nasally and if you want to chime in and ask a question chime in if you want to hold it and just send me an email and i'll respond to it happy to do that I've had a couple of messages with folks who might have to go away early. That's not a problem. Everybody will get a copy of this. Assuming that the recording goes through, we can only hope. And we'll take it from there. This is kind of where I, we, there's a lot, as you can see, if you scroll through this, about the intricacy of water versus lipid-soluble hormones. It all has to do with second messenger systems as opposed to immediate responses and some and, and if you go into the science behind it some of these work comparatively quickly even for endocrine which is slower than the nervous system and some take a longer period of time to paint with a broad brush the water soluble hormones probably work and some of them work a little bit faster particularly if they open what are called ion channels because things work pretty quick in the body when you start moving ions around because you send action potentials as opposed to fat soluble hormones which is the old story they take longer to work but they stay with you longer it, it it's not doesn't diminish or enhance the importance of either it speaks more to speed so i'm not going to go into it as i begin to go through this all the again the intricacies of cyclic amp and and, and calcium passageways, et cetera, et cetera, and adenylate cyclase. That's the kind of stuff we do with the advanced physiology class that I teach next term for the, for the bio majors and pre-meds. And then just go through these. And the same thing with that. But there's a lot of different signaling mechanisms. We'll talk about tyrosine kinase. Why do we understand it? Because of insulin. And insulin is a major player. It all has to do in this part of this part of this chapter, particularly when we look at the insulin aspect, which leads into the diabetes aspect, which are really important for anybody who's going anywhere into the healthcare. Arguably the most common medical diagnosis, endocrine diagnosis, is diabetes, depending on the population that you treat or you interact with. So what will happen? Okay, so we'll we'll look more at that, but and it's understood probably as well as any. And I'll comment a little bit about that. Well, again, without going into the gory details. Lipid, different because it gets through relatively easily the membrane. It bonds in the cytoplasm to its receptor rather than on the membrane. And then effectively goes is able to pass into the nuclear membrane and just directly 
alter transcription and translation. So it starts making the proteins that basically cause it to do what it's there to do. We can go through these. Well, so, and I'll probably skip this. Uh, it, it will likely work. I don't want to go through. I, I happen to like the animations that are there. I don't know how well they play this way. I've got to make sure that they're set up to play properly when I get back into the classroom that we're using to make sure that that all works because it wasn't before. And so I'll hold off on that. But you have it here and you'll be able to play it on your own system, I would think. That's there. Now, this is really what we're talking about. This is how the systems work. Nearly all of them, with the exception of a couple, are based on negative feedback. Okay? There's very, very little. And I, I, again, the default is always negative feedback. The ones that don't work this way with these systems, again, blood clotting is a positive feedback mechanism. Uh, the birth canal process with oxytocin and pitocin, which is in this unit, is positive feedback. When we get to female reproductive, very much at the end of the term, there's a, a, a fair amount of positive feedback. Those are the areas where you see it. I mean, blood clotting and generally, and, and, and other than that, mostly female repro are really the areas where we see positive feedback more than anything else. So the default for how things, how your sugar is controlled and your calcium controlled, et cetera, et cetera, negative feedback. And so you begin, and so we'll begin there. So it's triggered by endocrine glands being stimulated, nervous system modifies it as you will see. So it's broken down into how things work based on three different areas. Humoral, when they say humor, humor means things in the bloodstream. So whether it's calcium levels or glucose levels or other type of hormonal levels, those are humoral stimuli. Neural stimuli, you're already a little bit familiar with. That's autonomic nervous system. That's fight or flight. That's that kind of a thing. So neural stimuli will cause alterations in it. And there's a lot of hormonal stimuli. It's one hormone inducing another. So humoral, classic example, ions and nutrients, calcium, particularly very well understood. This is part of this unit, which we'll get to. Basic number one agent that helps with your blood calcium levels, because calcium is vital for so many functions, is PTH, which we'll get to. It's called parathyroid hormone. So as it goes down, parathyroid hormone ramps up. And what it does is it begins to, for lack of a better term, leach or pull out calcium, mostly out of bone, but other areas, cause it to rise. And as it rises, and this is what this is the, the heart of negative feedback, is it begins to rise, the need and the amount of its production begins to lower. So it's auto-correcting almost instantaneously. The, the minute those calcium levels start to rise with the hormone being activated, the signal begins to stop activating them. So they'll show it to you. That's there. This is the this is the parathyroids, and we'll get to where they're located on the back or posterior aspect of the thyroid gland. They're tiny but extraordinarily important. So we'll get into that shortly. Nerve fibers. Okay. All the time. The, the number one hit parade, best example possible, sympathetic nervous system. So what happens? The adrenal medulla, and we'll get to it here, is the oddball because it, it, it's considered by some a gland. It really isn't. It's really part of the autonomic nervous system. It's the ganglion of the sympathetic nervous system that happens to be located deep within the adrenal gland. Most of our focus on the adrenal gland is going to be on the adrenal cortical area. So it's a, sort of an oddball to start with. All it means is that when you experience fight or flight, and you learned about that before, when you get something excites you, what happens? That signal goes into the deep within the adrenal gland into a unique area where it produces something called catecholamines. Read that as epinephrine and norepinephrine. In the old days, that was adrenaline and noradrenaline. They just changed the name. They derived their name from the adrenal gland, hence adrenaline. So it came in there and it released directly into the bloodstream because really it's <clears throat> it's it, so that's where the, the the concept of endocrine activity came from and it sort of prolongs that's what happens with fight or flight so you're driving the car some idiot tries to cut you off you get really 
you, you have to respond quickly. And if you're, you might even gotten, may have just avoided an accident and all of a sudden you might even pull off the side of the road and your heart's racing and you're perspiring and you're angry and all of those things. Those are the more prolonged activity. Your blood pressure will be up, your pulse will be racing, etc. That's the prolonged activity. That's the part that the secretions here of the epinephrine and norepinephrine too. And we, we'll look at them a little bit as well. Hormonal stimuli is one hormone triggering, triggering another. And these are classic, and the term we use a lot are arcs. And you'll see these repetitively. So the, you'll see an arc, let's say, in, particularly let's say in the menstrual cycle, where what happens as the, the, the brain detect, detects decreasing levels of estrogen and particularly progesterone as a woman gets toward the end of her cycle, assuming there has not been fertilization and implantation. Those, because where the, where the hormones are coming from is starting to deteriorate in the absence of implantation or fertilization. At that point, that effectively creates a trigger that your body's able to perceive and produce a response from that. So classically what happens, most of the anterior pituitary hormones come from stimuli and we'll get into what those are in the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is an interesting area because it's where the blood brain barrier is the weakest. So calcium and sugar and hormone levels, because the barrier is weak, Sensors are there to read whether they're too high or too low or just right. They then trigger and send messenger hormones. And basically, you're going to see they're either called <coughs> pardon me, releasing hormones or inhibitory hormones. So they're either going to upregulate or downregulate. Meaning if you don't have enough, it's going to kind of say, up, oh, make more. And if you have too much, it's going to say, make less. So that's going to trigger the, it's going to send the message to the anterior pituitary. And then that's going, to, based on the message, is either going to make something or not make something. So the classic loop is hypothalamic pituitary target endocrine organ feedback loop. And so you'll see some examples of that. So, and, and these are just classic examples. I was talking about a one that was gonadal and in, in orientation, according to testes, not ovaries, <coughs> adrenal cortical and thyroid. And our nervous system can modulate this relatively easily. It can override that. So under certain, so under stress, as you can see, we get an override, and that's like fight or flight. So insulin is something that we use typically when we are more likely at rest than anything else. And insulin is typically secreted because we've had a meal, and we generally are not doing immediate activity afterwards. So they'll over, they'll do it but effectively. It's an override in that because our bodies are designed to use insulin at rest. They use other substances, not at rest. In order to be a target cell, it has to have a receptor. Some hormones and receptors are everywhere. Thyroid hormone, human growth hormone, insulin. An abundance of cells have those receptors. But if you think of things that are from, again, in reproductive physiology, which we'll get to called luteinizing hormone or FSH follicle stimulating hormone, very limited because they're specific to reproductive organs that are there. So as you can see, there's a limited amount of receptors, something that targets specifically the adrenal cortex and we'll get to it, but thyroid hormone receptors called thyroxin receptors everywhere. So lots of different factors, mostly blood level of those, whether you need to have more or less, the availability of the receptors, how well they bind. And that's pretty, to me, that's non-specific. That's sort of all, all the time. And these are terms that we use a lot of. So up and down regulation. Basically what this kind of means is if there are, they'll start to form more receptors if hormone levels are, so it's going to make itself more sensitive if the levels are low and less sensitive if the levels are high. Again, not a big deal for us. But in science and in biology, particularly, we talk a lot about up and down regulations. 
So with regard to these hormones, the question is, do they float freely or not? And again, this boils down to whether it's water soluble or fat soluble. Things that are water soluble are just that. So ones that are made out of proteins like insulin or ones with the, again, with the exception of thyroid hormone that are made out of, of peptide bases that are basically made of amino acids. Any of these that are considered to be water soluble, okay, circulate freely in the bloodstream. The steroidal hormones and thyroid hormone, because of its unique structure that we likely will get to today, and its symmetry have to have a carrier molecule in order to get around. So what that carrier molecule does is it kind of latches onto it and makes the, the complex of the carrier molecule and the hormone to some extent water soluble so it can move around the plasma. And so, and all of this is true, concentration of the hormone reflects how much has been released and how much it's basically broken down and removed. That's pretty standard stuff. And we look at this by a variety of things. We have some hormones have a relatively short lifespan. They have a lot of enzymes to break it down. And then as it circulates throughout your bloodstream and eventually makes its way through the kidneys and the liver, it degrades over time. The global term that we use biologically, and we use it not just in biology, but in chemistry and in other areas, in physics, we're talking about radiation. And for some of you going into imaging, you'll talk a lot about half-life. It's all related to the amount of time, in this case for the hormone, to decrease its level by half. In radiation, it's the amount of time for that amount of radiation to reduce by half, if I, if I recall you know, my radiation biology training. Okay, and so as you can see, in radiation biology, it's a bit different. But when it comes to biology and biochemistry, there's a wide range of time that's involved. And it really gives you an idea of how prolonged something that takes a long time to break down, it has a long time in your system. It's that old rule. The longer it takes to get started, the longer it tends to stick around. And it's, we, it's all a function of half-life. You'll do that when you're taking a medicine. I mean, it's a whole lot easier. And I use this analogy all the time. The way they formulated the very famous z pack that so many of us have taken for a variety of, of you know, respiratory infections over the years. Oh, sounds like somebody wants me. Anybody else want in? There we are. Somebody else joined. Okay. Whenever I have to hear that ding, I have to check to see if I have to admit somebody. So getting back to the idea of the half-life, it's, it, it's just that. It, there's a certain amount of variability that's associated with it. And we look at that. So if you can talk about the Z-Pack, oh, give me the Z-Pack, it's stronger. You only have to take one pill, uh, basically two pills the first day and one pill for the next four days, and boy, it goes away. No, it's not stronger. It's half-life. It's formulated to be released slowly over time and reaches the appropriate level in your bloodstream relatively rapidly and lasts for a period of about 10 days, as opposed to the old days when people took something called erythromycin, which is really what it is, with a different formulation. They had to take one pill four times a day. And because they were taking so much of that pill, it really upset your stomach a lot. And it's a big problem with a lot of antibiotics. The z pack magically took care of both those problems. Easy compliance, take it once a day, less side effects. Okay. That's why I made, uh, it was a it's a billion dollar drug for Pfizer. So as you can see, there's some variation. Typically the steroidal ones, a little bit longer. A lot of them, and this is by design, they're not active until they get to where they're supposed to be. So as you can see, there's a wide range, depending on a variety of factors. All of those are part of the process. So that's sort of the introductory material, okay? And there's just a comparison. Again, the thyroid hormone is the odd vol because it's in the lipid soluble, important to remember. It comes from all different places. The adrenal cortex, the gonads, and the thyroid are the only ones that make the steroidal hormones. These are not necessarily stored. Secretory vesicles are more about proteins. So that's the kind of thing like where insulin comes from your pancreas. It's sort of spit out in these secretory vesicles. 
bound versus free because of water solubility, longer versus shorter, inside the cell on the membrane, talked about that. And it does, and, and they all work through a variety of things, mostly genetic mechanisms for lipid, water, for that. So it's an important, I really feel it's an important point. We can certainly see that as test material. And so, the, and there's different little nuances that we see associated with, with all of this stuff. A lot of times you need one agent to permit the other one. So thyroid hormone plays such an important role. So people with excessively low thyroid levels have a lot of trouble with satisfactory reproductive health. And so that yeah, is one of the things you look for. One of the things you would certainly test if someone came to you with an infertility related problem, you'd look at their thyroid levels that are there. So permissiveness means it allows it to work. The fact that, that one thing is there doesn't mean that it works well without being in concert with something else. And the, the, very interesting. Okay. Synergism, more than one hormone produces the same effect on a target cell and he amplifies it. Epinephrine gives you a sugar rush. Basically, it releases sugar for energy to do fight or flight. Glucagon does the same thing. They don't come from the same place. Glucagon comes from the pancreas and very often is released at the same time as insulin. Basically, while insulin's working rapidly lowering the sugar, the glucagon is working to sort of counteract the extreme aspects of that, softening the blow, if you will, to make it less likely to make your sugar bottom out real fast. And you ever had your sugar bottom out, it's no fun. And sometimes they work opposite other. The example again, insulin and glucagon. Why are they released at the same time? To avoid extreme drops or extreme elevations in blood sugar that can be very harmful. So, which brings us to the anatomy portion of this. The hypothalamus is part of the central nervous system. It's part of the brain. It's very tiny. And effectively, it has a tiny stalk called the infundibulum. Okay. And the hypothalamus, actually, the, the, the infundibulum portion of that really forms eventually what's called the posterior portion of the pituitary. Also known as the neuro, because the fancy name we give it is hypothesis. It's called the neurohypothesis. And it actually acts as an endocrine organ in and of itself because it secretes a couple of important hormones directly into the bloodstream. Whereas, as you can see, the pituitary, the anterior pituitary, known as the adeno, adeno means glandular, is strictly glandular tissue. So these are the two terms. And between them, there's eight major hormones and a variety of lesser hormones, as you will say. They are in close proximity. So typically the posterior pituitary sends those up and down regulators to the anterior pituitary. But in order to do this, okay, it doesn't take very long because they're next to each other. Surrounding the pituitary is a mass of blood vessels that absorb those hormones like a sponge. And as soon as they're secreted, they basically contact the from the posterior to the anterior, it has a fancy name, the hypothalamic hypophyseal tract. They're, you know, different nuclei, not a big deal. And it's just there. So inevitably, there's always a rich blood supply around those. So let's look at the ones that it secretes that are neurohormones that are very famous and play a pivotal role in a lot of things. Number one, oxytocin. These are both oxytocin, what's called antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin, because it raises your blood pressure, are both made by the posterior pituitary and go, and it did directly go into the bloodstream, except their point of action, this is in the birth canal, and this is in the kidney. Okay. So they're released when those nerves fire. So here they are. They come from something fancy thing called the paraventricular nucleus. They form this tract and out they go. Oxytocin, antidiuretic hormone. This is the stalk, the infundibulum, this area here. This is posterior pituitary. A lot of sensors, again, blood, blood brain barrier, relatively weak there. And, there's, and this is all anterior pituitary and surrounding this is this large nest of blood vessels. 
So, as you can see, they're different. And it's hard to tell from that illustration, but basically it's interesting that the glandular tissue actually comes from a outpouching of oral tissue. And if you, it's almost like if you put your finger in your mouth and to where your hard palate started to get soft and went straight up from there, you're into, you're basically into that little pocketing area that's there. There's a lot of blood supplies I pointed out to you. And so in addition to the ones that go out your bloodstream, the oxytocin and the vasopressin, we have, hope you're all awake out there, <laughs> releasing and inhibiting hormones. So you're going to see we got RHs and IHs. It's lots of fun. And so there's, and again, those are up regulators or down regulators. And we'll get into that as well. So here you can see this nest of blood vessels that surrounds it. If you examine the tissues microscopically, they look very, very much different. That's there. And so here they are. Paraventricular makes the oxytocin, something called the supraoptic, supraoptic rather, produces the antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin. There's, we make them genetically and they're used a lot. Oxytocin most famously is made genetically. We call it pitocin. So you're trying, sometimes you'll have to do that to induce labor. You'll hear about it all the time. You may be familiar with it already with folks that you know. And antidiuretic hormone is interestingly something we will, some, we will use in individuals to try to elevate their blood pressure. But interestingly enough, it has not, it's not its only activity. It affects the feedback loop in such a way that what it interestingly does is it tends to stimulate clotting mechanisms. And so you'll, it's called DDAVP. The DDA mean implies that it's made in the laboratory genetically. The VP stands for vasopressin. They're easy to make. And what this one does is sometimes it will be given to somebody who has some clotting abnormalities because it actually stimulates the clotting activity if they're having major dental surgery or they're having an operation somewhere else. And because my first wife had what's called a variant of something we'll learn about in the bloodstream called von Willebrand's disease. That was the treatment for it. We'll talk more about that then. So oxytocin also plays the role of milk ejection. This is positive feedback. It's the oddball that's there. So rather than when it, it, when it induces the, the birth canal to contract, it tends to push it forward rather than push backward. And the next and succeeding contractions are actually greater optimally. So and it, and they continue to be greater and greater until the baby is delivered. So what ends Rather than making the adjustment, oh, my calcium's getting back to normal. I don't have to produce as much parathyroid hormone. I'm just going to produce slews of it until it gets really high. Here, it doesn't stop until the, you know, the event of the baby being delivered. That's there. Okay. Antidiuretic hormone works specifically. Okay. And it works in areas where they're called osmoreceptors for standing for osmosis. And when you're and when things are too concentrated, okay, so you have to understand how this particularly works. If we're not making enough antidiuretic hormone, okay, so as you can see, if the concentration is too high, the posterior pituitary is triggered to secrete antidiuretic hormone. It basically causes you to retain fluid. The kidney tubules resorb more water and prevent urine formation. And there's other things that, that, that play around with it as well. And you're going to see there's even problems associated with it. Why we're careful with it is this. And this is something that a lot of people experience when they drink. Okay? Alcohol directly inhibits it. So when people are having a few drinks, they basically tend to go to the bathroom more. It's not, it's not the volume of the alcohol so much as it's what it's working on. Okay. So it also causes vasoconstriction. So it's called vasopressin. That means elevating the blood pressure that's there. So that's where we begin to see, like I said, it has more than those typical effects, but that's a, that's a pretty common thing. Anybody who's gone out and had, you know, a few drinks, you, know, you, you and your buddy's always running to the restroom, et cetera. And they're just showing it to you a little bit with some of the structures that are there.
a very interesting but not very common disease okay diabetes insipidus when the term diabetes though we when we say diabetes to everybody you think of sugar abnormalities the fancy last name for diabetes there is called mellitus m-e-l-l-i-t-u-s diabetes insipidus okay and i have no idea what the derivation is with that has to do with a deficiency of antidiuretic hormone because of some irregularity in the hypothalamic or pituitary area and those folks have a problem okay they don't retain fluids very well and they have to keep replenishing their fluids diabetes has nothing to do with sugar diabetes means the great thirst that's where the derivation of that word is so effectively this is known as salt diabetes versus sugar diabetes how did it come about to have that name what happens in the urine of somebody with sugar diabetes, more common diabetes, their urine typically has a larger amount of glucose. We dipstick it. Okay. That's what we used to do in the old days. And we'll get to that. That's how you monitored how well they were doing with their before we had glucometers and things like that. Thinking backwards, what happens in salt diabetes is the urine had a high concentration of salts. Okay. So there's, that was part of the difference that was associated with it. So there's other things retain. And so inappropriate, if you have produced too much, you retain fluid, very, very difficult. Uh, you have to really restrict fluids about those things. People tend to run very high. So this is relatively rare. That's there. And so this, I mean, this is probably the, this will probably take up most of the rest of our time for this today and we'll, 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 we'll finish up with, with some more stuff. It probably takes at least Thursday and maybe into Tuesday of next week to get through this system. It's a, it's a good three to four lecture unit in its totality. The anterior pituitary hormones, I like to call them the big six. You need to know. Them. Okay. Okay. All of them. Okay. Are peptide hormones. They are water soluble. Even though these are going to the gonadal areas, okay, they're not, they're not cholesterol-based or cortisone-based hormones. They, so that they, that, and students frequently have problem. They're there. All but growth hormone, which works slightly differently, work by cyclic A and P. Don't have to know that. All but two are tropic. Tropic just means that they regulate secretion of other hormones. I, I don't get too excited about that. Well, let's start. So, I mean, the growth, I, mean, I, I think indirectly, growth hormone probably does regulate other hormones that are there. And I don't want to make too fine a point of it, so I'm not going to. Growth hormone is just what it says. It's known as somato, which means body, tropin, growth. So, to me, it's a trope trophic hormone anyway, or tropic hormone as they, as they re refer to it here. Growth hormone is very interesting. It, it sort of has an interesting battle when, when you're growing, when you're growing and developing, particularly at the onset of certain areas of it, with kids, you always see that. But all of a sudden they get those growth spurts and it becomes very, very active, certainly at puberty and all of those things. And depending on the individual and other times during growth, they're very, very busy. And so, but it's not that they, once you've reached your adult size, it's not like as though they stop. That's a reparative hormone. Your body is secreting it all the time, particularly when you're injured, particularly when there's been some damage, whether it's a physical injury, whether it's you, 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 something inflammatory happened, you know, you had an infection from something else, uh, interior-wise, and there's repair processes. Think about any time when new materials have to be laid down. The interesting thing about growth hormone is it works on nearly all the cells and very importantly, its source of energy are fats. And as you will come to learn, insulin source of energy for it to work is sugar. And therein is a big difference. It's what makes, for those of you who are in athletes, it's one of the things we see all the time. One of the things that was very, very hard to deal with 
It's a performance enhancing drug of the highest order. What effectively growth hormone does is it basically causes your body to repair itself rapidly and make whether it's new tissue or particularly new muscle or healthy muscle and it you know, breaks down fat think of an athlete how much stronger they can get that way it works the same way that we talk about anabolic steroids they work the same way and that's part of this discussion that's there so that's interesting in that regard thyroid stimulating hormone is just that it works it's very limited it's not thyroid hormone Thyroid hormone, or thyroxin, works on all cells. Thyroid stimulating hormone is, so where growth hormone goes everywhere, thyroid stimulating hormone is limited. It goes to the thyroid and stimulates production of thyroid hormones. Adrenocorticotropic hormone, always known as ACTH, because it's got this A, the C, the T, and the H, that's there. That works directly on the adrenal cortex. That's it. So these are very limited targets, limited targets. Follicle stimulating and luteinizing hormone, <coughs> pardon me, limited targets. Follicle works on the follicles. That's where, re re respectively, eggs and sperm are produced in the ovaries and the testes. Luteinizing hormone, same area estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. Prolactin specifically works, as you will see, it's probably the one we understand the least, and it does play an overall role, certainly during lactation as much as any else and during pregnancy. But, you know, its role is not clearly understood. So we'll take them one by one. So as you can see, the growth hormone is really the only one of these that's particularly generalized and goes everywhere. The other ones eventually cause things to happen, like thyroid stimulating hormone will get the thyroid working, and then the thyroid hormone will go everywhere. So somatotropin, somatotropic cells, increases metabolism, promotes growth. It and this is the whole idea: is a tug of war. When we're eating and we're at rest, we use insulin. When we're active and physical, we tend to use more growth hormone. Okay. And when insulin's busy, growth hormone is not. When growth hormone is busy, insulin is not. So it actually decreases the rate of cellular glucose uptake and metabolism as it com combats the long term. It opposes insulin. So it's an interesting balance and tug of war that goes on between these. So it gets the liver breaks down glycogen into glucose. So it works differently than bringing glucose into the cells. But we get a lot more fatty acids. That's where the fuel comes from to make protein synthesis, to make to basically do the repair processes. To me, that's pretty interesting stuff, I think. All of those things. They call them insulin. It's interesting. It produces something called insulin-like growth factors. We will comment on a lot. We'll talk a lot about growth factors. When we get to blood, you're going to hear about plasma-derived growth factors. In the nerve unit, we talked about nerve growth factors. Growth factors are interesting chemicals we're starting to understand. And so these insulin-like growth factors are, are, are something like that. And, and, and what do they do? Uptake nutrients, form collagen, deposit bone. <laughs> so you can see how growth hormone is like this, this perfect repair substance for athletes to get healthier, stronger, and why uh, during what, quote unquote, the steroid area in sport and in baseball, and it goes on today. We see it all the time. If you're, uh, the whole idea of, of, of the, the, the World Doping Authority Agency, WADA, I think it is, uh, it, it, there, there's so much that's done and a lot of penalties for using it because it, it really, and this is the misunderstanding for a typical individual it might help you get better for a world-class athlete your ability to this that uptick maybe it's a percentage or two is the difference between winning an olympic event uh, winning a world cup uh, winning a world series winning a super bowl large divide etc that's where the problem is 
So you see a lot, I mean, that's, and it's interesting because as we begin, as we have more sophisticated tests for the people who are making illicit ones, figure out ways to avoid the next level of tests. So growth hormone releases inhibition, chiefly reg release or inhibition, chiefly regulated by a variety of hypothalamic. So when we need more of it, you get a release hormone it's called GHRH low blood growth hormone or glucose or high amino acid levels. So there's different things will do it that will trigger it. Okay. And one called the inhibiting hormone where the, where the growth hormone itself is known as somatotropin is called somatostatin. Also ghrelin, which is a hunger hormone. So you can see it goes through, we'll go through all of these different things as we begin to go on. I'm not going to go read those to you because you can look at them themselves. What's interesting are the, and, and, and again, I just want you to know about growth hormone, perhaps targeting all those cells using fat for its fuel. <laughs> Yes, it's upregulated and downregulated by different factors out of the out of the posterior pituitary. Whereas something like the abnormalities are comparatively rare. Okay, you don't see them a lot. The difference between gigantism and acromegaly, as long as the growth plates are open and we have growth hormone, a person can grow extraordinarily, let's say, tall. Where in adults with the growth plates closed, effectively what happens, acro means tip areas. So the, things widen much more than they elongate. And it's somewhat bizarre. So the facial bones, the hands and the feet really become disproportionately large and thick. Okay. If we have, don't have enough of it, hyposecretion, it's called pituitary dwarfism. There's different kinds of dwarfism that are there. So I don't mean to use it as a pejorative term or an appropriate term from a medical perspective. We talk about, we use that particular term that's there. And it's, it, it, it's, <laughs> so I don't know what the politically correct term necessarily would be, but there's more than one cause. So this is certainly one of the causes, you know, if, if you're not making enough as an adult, it's less of a problem than you think. And they always show you the same illustration when someone who's very small, someone who's very tall, and and you can, and they always show you the same illustration for acromegaly, which is which is fairly bizarre when, when we begin to look at it. The next one in the list, thyroid stimulating hormone. Thyrotropin, because it makes the thyroid grow or do or tropic or induce other things. Normal development, secretion, and activity. Thyroid's important. When the thyroid is one of those, when we get to it, the thyroid proper, as long as the thyroid's working properly, everything else seems to work properly. It's influential. Appropriate levels of thyroid hormone are influential in keeping everything in regulation. That's what the thyroid does. Basically, regulate your body's activities at a normal level. And so, there's TRH, okay? Release is triggered by a release hormone. It's inhibited by that somatostatin, that somatotrope, a, a bigger part of statin, uh, GHIH, or rising blood levels. If there's too many thyroid hormones, we slow down. So it's pretty well controlled for the most part. We don't see a lot of irregularities in TSH unless there's some primary thyroid problem. It is one of the things when we work up or evaluate somebody for thyroid disease, we monitor TSH levels to see if there's a problem, TRH levels rather. So I beg your pardon, but TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone levels, and then they can look at the release hormones. So here's how it works. So the hypothalamus get, gets feedback. And so if there's too many thyroid hormones, it slows it down. Okay. And it'll slow down all of those things. But in, it, it will stimulate, once these levels fall, then the hypothalamus will stimulate the anterior pituitary to stimulate the thyroid, just to stimulate the release of thyroid hormone to the target cells. So we'll get into the thyroid proper, but probably not today. ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone, the old days called corticotropin, okay, because the name's for the cells. Uh, it's the melano, it's interesting, and I'll get into it when we talk about 
uh, adrenal ad, adrenal irregularities. It plays a role in melanin production. So pigmentation, we sometimes see in adrenal abnormalities, adrenal cortical abnormalities. And so what does it do? It stimulates adrenal cortex to make three different major kinds of corticosteroids, which we'll get to. Again, release hormones play a role. And this is a big player. In general, when whatever our biological clock is, and most of us, our clock is set to basically be the morning being our getting up time and getting our body ready to do its daily work. So what you'll see, and, and for years, I don't know if it's as many as it was today, a lot of patients were on steroids because we, it was the only thing we really could treat immunological disorders with. And you had to be on top of it. Uh, if you ever had something, and maybe you did, if you had a really bad rash or poison ivy or an inflammatory flu, maybe you just think called dose pack. And it's designed to take it very high doses, diminishing every day over six days. And your last doses are only in the morning. That's because of this. Because you want to, you don't want to offset this mechanism. You have to get that mechanism has to be what typically whenever what your morning is your morning. And you can adjust that if somebody's working, you know, hey, I sleep from 3 to 11 because I work midnight, midnight to 8 every morning. Okay. So there's lots of different things that can play a role with it. Things that also play a role with it were fever, low blood sugar, various stressors, all of those because they can trigger your adrenal gland. The last unit we look at are these which are all reproductively oriented, FSH and LH, okay? Gonadotropic cells, FSH again, follicles means gametes, eggs and sperm, luteinizing hormone, <coughs> plays an important role in maturation of follicles, ovulation, which we'll get to, release of estrogen and progesterone. In males, it's about testosterone. They're absent in the blood and prepubescent boys and girls. We don't make any. It is regulated, and this is a big player you do need to know, that comes from the posterior pituitary called gonadotropin release hormone, GNRH, starting during and then after puberty. And it's suppressed as long as you have levels of the gonadal hormones, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone in abundance. When it's not there, you'll, you'll, uh, this will be released and it'll trigger the release of FSH and LH. That's a big player, particularly when we get to reproductive phase. And then lastly, prolactin, anterior pituitary, milk production, not well understood in males. There's an inhibiting hormone, which happens to be dopamine, which is also a neurotransmitter. So that inhibits it until it's needed. It's really hard to understand the role it has because we know it plays a role in lactation. But interestingly, they'll make this comment in this PowerPoint. And I heard about this when I was in school. When you have pituitary tumors are, are more common than you think. One of the signs of a pituitary hormone, okay, is inappropriate lactation. Where be it a man or a woman begins to lactate, okay, all of a sudden milk production when it should not happen. And, and, and the first 63 things, I say it all the time, that if a clinician thinks about when they hear about inappropriate lactations, well, I better, I've got to check for pituitary tumor. <coughs> so as you can see, estrogen levels stimulate its release, swelling and tenderness during menstruation, towards the end of pregnancy, suckling stimulates its release as well is more common than hypo, so we get more than less. Hyposecretion is not anyone other than a nursing female. <coughs> Hyperprolactinemia is the most frequent abnormality of anterior pituitary tumors. Inappropriate lactation, lack of menstruation, fertility, and impotence. So all of those are little triggers that particularly the lactation and it's, again, one of the things in an evaluation we call a workup for all these things that a clinician thinks about, because we well, better check this stuff out. And, you get, and, and this just summarizes all that stuff. You know, ladies and gentlemen, my voice is not going to make it. So we're going to call it a day here. All right, I've got through this, uh, this, this unit. If you have any questions, 
feel free to say, see you later. I'm happy to do that. <laughs> All right. And I, I will let you know as soon as I know, probably sometime tomorrow, what's going on for Thursday. And thanks a lot. Bye-bye.